Well, welcome. Uh, this is our uh, third in our series of campus conversations. Um, today's topic is the world around us, immigration, migration, migration and displacement, what's going on and why. Uh, this is a series that we started uh, in September. We've done one of these on uh, the summer of 2016. Uh, and police violence. Uh, we did one on the election, uh, which is on everyone's mind, I imagine, uh, today. And I, I was a little late today because I voted. Um, and then we're doing this one, and there'll be three more next semester. Uh, as with the previous two, today's session will be followed um, next week, next Wednesday uh, at noon, uh, by an open forum on the same topic. So I encourage you to uh, attend that as well. And it will also be um, here in Student Center. Um, East. Uh, so let me very briefly introduce the panel with just a sentence or two because you're here to listen to them um, and not me. Uh, first, uh, skipping over for a moment, uh, Professor um, Polaris, uh, Susan Zesch uh, is the Executive Director of the Posen, uh, that's Posen, no relation, um, Family Center for Human Rights and a Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago. Uh, Susan Zesch was appointed Executive Director of the Posen Center in 2001 after two decades of practicing law and teaching at the University of Chicago Law School. She directs center activities including the Human Rights Internship Program, Study Abroad, Support for Research, Teaching and Events, Fundraising and Outreach, and Faculty Initiatives on topics including Migration and Human Rights and Health and Human Rights. Um, to her uh, right is Sochil Bada, uh, professor, and uh, Professor Bada is one of UIC's own. Uh, she is an associate professor of Latin American and Latino studies here at UIC. Uh, professor Bada's scholarship focuses on the civic, cultural, and political par participation of Chicago-based Mexican mi migrant hometown association associations, and her research interests include immigrant access to political and social rights, Black Latino relations, transnational communities, and and intersections of migration and rural development through civic participation. Um, and she's got a lot more on her resume than that, but I will stop there. Um, uh, to, her right, it, uh, to her right is Mary Meg McCarthy. She leads, uh, she's the executive director of Heartland Alliance National Immigrant Justice Center. She leads one of the nation's foremost immigrant and human rights advocacy organizations working with a pro bono network of 1,500 attorneys. The center provides counsel and representation to approximately 10,000 low-income immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers each year. Um, and finally, to my right, uh, Professor Amalia Polaris, Professor of Political Science here at UIC and Director of the Latin American and Latino Studies uh, Program. Uh, she's also the uh, convener of today's panel, and I want to thank you very much for that, um, Amalia. Uh, Professor Polaris studies social movements, ethnicity, and race in Latin America and in the U.S. Her work focuses on the relationship between political activism and identity formation among newly politicized groups. She has several. She has written and, and edited several books, um, and, and she will moderate today's panel. So again, many thanks to uh, Professor Polaris, and uh, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Provost Poser, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, today, at the suggestion of Sochibala, we're going to follow a dynamic format, what's called a fishbowl format in the NGO world. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask um, uh, the panelists uh, questions, specific questions that they are going to answer. But first, I want to uh, start with a question for all three of the panelists, and that is, how did you become engaged with questions of migration and displacement, and why do you do what you do? Um, Susan? Sure. Hi. First, I would love like to thank UIC, their provost, um, Amalia Payares, and uh, the rest of the university for making this opportunity possible. I also want to spend some of my three minutes giving a shout out to people who I've learned from who are in this room uh, once I got the decision to be interested in migration issues. Nena Torres, who has done pioneering work as a political scientist in understanding not only um, why and how people come to the United States, but also what their influence is once they're here. Andreas Feldman, now professor here, who was our postdoc at the University of Chicago and really helped me connect human rights with migration. And Sarah Moberg, now here's a doctoral student in sociology, who worked with us in the Human Rights Center and helped 
us fit in how activism and grassroots organizations are important to telling stories of policy and rights. Um, I have basically, I would say about two reasons for why I got involved in this topic professionally. One is family history. My grandparents came here like many other Jews from the oppressed and marginalized Yiddish speaking communities of Poland and other Euro Eastern European countries and they managed to get into the US just before the immigration quotas barring the immigration of more Jews came crashing down in the early 1920s. So together with several siblings, each of them, they were, they met their spouses, established families here, but were incredibly frustrated during the 1930s as the shadow of Nazism came over the communities that they had come from, that they were barred from bringing relatives here by um, the U.S. Congress's decision to bar Jews, Catholics, other people from Southern and Eastern Europe from immigrating to the U.S. After the war, um, about a dozen of my father's first cousins who had survived the ghetto in Woods, who had survived the forced marches at the end of the war, were able to come to the United States as displaced persons sponsored by my grandfather. I grew up with cousins who worked in probably every Jewish bakery in Chicago, and they all had numbers tattooed on their arms. That's a pretty strong family impetus to become involved and interested in how immigration laws can be unfair, how the decisions are made to make those laws, and how to defend people from the impact of those laws and try to help them get around them. And then the reason I was able to access this as an area of work is that almost by accident, I ended up going to Mexico to take Spanish um, after the end of my uh, last year in college. And so going into law school at the University of Michigan in the middle 70s, it was a period and a place where interest in the rights of immigrants was beginning to be part of the agenda of social justice lawyering. And because I'd managed to learn Spanish, I was positioned in a way that this my career began to follow the path of the development of an immigrants' rights movement here in the U.S., particularly in Chicago. In fact, I moved back to Chicago in 1980 from Minnesota, where I was working on uh, farm worker rights, to um, take advantage of the chance to combine my law practice with the development of an active immigrants' rights movement, a lot of which got its impulse here at UIC during that period from now alumnus Jesus Garcia and a lot of the people who were working with him. So in some ways this is coming full circle to come back to the place where some of the inspiration for my own career came from to speak to the student body at UIC. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> and um, it's an honor to be here this morning. Thank you to Amalia and the, uh, the provost for organizing this series. It's very important to be discussing these issues in our current climate. So uh, let me share why is it that I decided to pursue issues of migration and displacement. That happened when I became a graduate student in New York City. I was attending the New School for Social Research in the year of 1998. That happened two years after the immigration reform of 1996. So the streets of New York were like bustling with uh, organizing for Fix 96. That was the rallying cry then when they were trying, all the advocates in the city were trying to fix all the most pervasive um, clauses that were affecting like uh, welfare stamps and access to education, like access to tuition for undocumented, etc. And then I, I decided during my graduate school years to become a volunteer for a faith-based organization named Tepeyaca Association of New York, which was a coalition of 40 Guadalupano committees who were working in the five boroughs. And I volunteered for two committees, for the Labor Rights Committee, and for the visitation committee. And let me tell you that the, the, the word that impacted me the most was the visitation committee because what they did was to go to the prison center, the detention centers in Elizabeth, New Jersey, to visit all those workers who had been caught in the raids in, the raids in 1998. And the, the work of this NGO, what we had to do when we were interviewing the workers was to make sure that the consular protection was taking place, to make sure that the Mexican government was offering the then 20 $20 that they were offering them to pay for a phone call or that to pay for some like a sandwich or something upon deportation. 
So when I started taking the, 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 I had the opportunity to interview these workers, they were telling me that the most shocking thing for them was to be wearing these orange prison uniforms. Because for them, it was not a criminal offense to having been working in a factory in Manhattan or, or in Brooklyn, etc., just to put food on the table. That the, the, they found this disconnect, and they were like uh, trying to make sense of that, and that really hit hard on me, and said, "Well, this is something that I just couldn't realize coming from a middle class uh, as Mexican, uh, having had the opportunity to go to public education in Mexico, and now having the privilege to be attending with a full scholarship at the new school, and then I moved to Chicago." Uh, and I pursued a job in NGO world, and I submitted um, a job application to Susan Sesh to work for the Mexico-US Advocates Network. And um, she told me that she had a wonderful project uh, doing capacity building for Mexican hometown associations that back in, th in the year 2000 were like these fledging organizations that had not been like the, the powerhouse that they are today in the city. But then Susan had just obtained a grant from the Ford Foundation, and she hired me for an entire summer to work on capacity building for Mexican NGOs. So this is when I was able to put these two and two together, that yes, there is this victimization moment in which workers are disrespected and they are yelled for having committed uh, the sin or the uh, or what this co the government considered that they deserve to be put in detention for putting food on the table. And then on the other hand, I come to Chicago and I start to, to bring, uh, to study capacity building and supporting organizations who are trying to address root causes of migration. So that the idea is that they are going to be able to choose between staying at home or migrating, but when migration is not going to be the only option in hand. And hopefully in the next quest, in the next round of questions, we will be able to address those issues more in depth. But this is more or less how I came engaged with these uh, topics. Thank you, Sochin. Mary Meg. Thank you. Um, I echo my colleagues' thanks to um, the provost and to Amalia, um, and recognize a lot of uh, faces in, in the room, and we're thrilled that you're here. And also want to recognize Tanya Cabrera, who's really been a strong advocate on behalf of um, undocumented youth and in ensuring that um, the young immigrants in our communities have access to um, higher education, which has been really critical um, to the social fabric of our communities. Um, and and I, I, I'm not to embarrass Andres, but um, my um, origins in this work really comes from my work in Chile. Um, after I graduated from college, I went down to um, Santiago, Chile, where I worked with um, small communities who were under attack um, uh, while living under the dictatorship. And I would always say, well, let's go to court. And there was no such thing as access to the courts um, for those individuals who disappeared or who were tortured, who were abused. And um, I, I came back to the United States, and I remember it was in 1982-83, and you know Harold Washington was running for mayor, and I'm in Lincoln Park jogging with some friends, and I'm like, oh, it's so exciting, you guys get to vote, and they're like, oh, we're not going to bother. I'm like, what? I just came from a dictatorship where people didn't have a right to vote. People didn't have access to the courthouse. And um, I think that was really my motivator uh, to engaging in the work on behalf of immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, I then went and pursued a law degree. And while in law school, I volunteered for the current organization that I work with now. And um, after I graduated, I went into private practice and was a pro bono attorney. As um, the provost said, um, we have about 1,500 pro bono attorneys. And I was one of those pro bono attorneys who represented asylum seekers. And um, coincidentally, there were Chileans who were fleeing persecution in their home countries and seeking protection in the United States. And then subsequently um, represented Central Americans. Um, then eventually decided um, enough of private practice and law firm life and um, that I really wanted to follow my true heart's um, desire and the passion that um, really motivated me to become a lawyer, which was to ensure access to justice for all individuals um, and to ensure that we have a democracy that's not a two-tiered system, one for citizens and one for non-citizens, but that it's a democracy that ensures access to all of the legal protections that exist in our country for all individuals. So. Um, 
that's my story in a nutshell. And um, it's been almost 20 years that I have been engaged with this organization. And um, as Solchi Cha mentioned, we've seen a lot of changes. And uh, the 1996 law, which I'm sure we're all going to be talking about today, um, really was a game changer. Thank you, Mary Meg. These are fascinating and inspiring stories. Um, let's start now with questions uh, um, directed uh, to um, individuals. Uh, let's see. Susan, let's start with you. Today, immigration is a very controversial issue, especially the topic of undocumented immigration. Let's, uh, let's start by asking, how did we get to this point, to having a population of approximately 11 million undocumented immigrants? How have our past policies played a role in creating this situation? Well, I wanted to start by saying it's impossible to answer this question in three minutes, so being a professor, I want to give you a couple of books to read. Um, I think that the single, first of all, I think that this, the answer to this question has to trace the role of race in American history and American policy. And to do that would require, it, a very, very long time, um, at least one course, and probably there are many more dedicated to that topic at this institution. So a book I would recommend to everyone here is by um, now Columbia University professor May Nye, N-G-A-I, and it's called Impossible Subjects. And it really traces the role of how racial politics in the United States describe a situation in which some people are here today without access to legal status. They comprise the undocumented. While as other groups have not had that problem in the past, that there have been laws that have allowed other people to regularize and legalize their status. So I think that her book, which goes up to 1965, does a very good job of tracing the historical roots of a dilemma that we have today where almost all of the 11 million undocumented are people of color and how that has worked out in the role that race has played in the formation of these policies. But I want to reflect very quickly on, I think, two sets of policies that have gotten us to this point. One are domestic um, laws governing immigration. In other words, who gets to enter our national territory? Under what terms? How long can they stay? Is there a legal status and secure status or a path to citizenship available to them or not? And the second question is how our foreign policy interests, which include um, questions of war and questions of trade, have created the situation that we're in. So I can't possibly do in three minutes what I would be doing in a 10-week course, and even then inadequately. So I just want to hit a couple of highlights. First of all, um, our current system of who gets legal status was really put into US law starting in 1965. This act of 1965, to some sectors of American American society was seen as a f an important forward move and an advance over national origin specific um, legislation that had been in place since the late 19th and early 20th century, barring the entrance of Asians and the 1920s barring the entrance of people from Southern and Eastern Europe. And both of those were lifted in 1965, thanks to a lot of lobbying work by citizens groups involved with and part of those communities. But the Latin Americans ended up getting the short end of the stick in 1965. The Bracero Act, which had brought Mexican workers legally to the US, but under very awful conditions in many cases, was ended. And in 65 and 76, quotas were imposed for the first time, numerical annual caps on legal migration from Mexico and other Latin American countries, which had not been under those quotas before. So a natural flow of migration, which had been encouraged by US labor policies by the Bracero program kept going after 1965, but as Douglas Massey and Jorge Duran, who are two of the leading um, social scientists studying this phenomenon, have said that it's almost overnight that flow changes from being fundamentally legal to being fundamentally illegal. In other words, people are still coming, but the legal nature of their status has just changed. And 20 years later, in 19, by 1986, the US Congress realizes that the system simply isn't working. We're not providing legal opportunities for people whose work is needed here, who are coming here because of family ties. So they come up with the 1986 so-called amnesty. But now, 20 years after that, you still have the same 
social forces pushing and pulling migration, and Congress got bogged down in the last 10 years in providing any form of comprehensive um, immigration reform to rectify what I think was a fundamental error made by Congress, or maybe they did it on purpose, um, but the policy consequences have been very bad of 1965 and 1976. Our foreign policy and um, trade policies have also caused the migration of people who are coming here from countries which, as I just said, don't have adequate legal access for the flows that other parts of our policies generate. So specifically, Mexico, Mexican migration to the US has been tremendously influenced by both our trade policies and our drug policies. Our trade policies in that the economic restructuring of Mexico which was accelerated by the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994, has really pushed Mexican migration. It may be leveling off somewhat now due to those factors, but what has not stopped is our tremendous consumption of, un of illegal drugs and manufacture and sale of firearms, which has tremendously impacted the factors of danger in Mexico and Central America, and in addition to our wars that we supported in Central America and prolonged by US aid, have created social conditions which have produced a large part of what um, now comprises the 11 million undocumented people here. Am I done? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Mary Meg. Uh, many scholars have written about increases in enforcement, and by enforcement we mean detention, uh, deportation, both at the level of the border and what we call internal enforcement, especially in the last two decades. Why and how has this happened? What are the pros and cons of increased enforcement? Well, let me answer the first question. Why has this happened? And um, I meant referenced this earlier. Um, since 1996, 20 years ago, we have been on a, what I would call an enforcement heavy skid um, where the laws dramatically change and you rem remember um, it was after the Oklahoma bombing when we just saw a flood of activity um, in terms of just really cracking down on, on the immigrant community. And in that we saw expansion of grounds for removal people who had old long-term crime, uh, excuse me, old minor crimes were now potentially even lawful permanent residents facing deportation. Um, secondly, you had a limited forms of relief for people. Again, these are even people who had green cards for years here in the United States. There were no waivers available anymore. Three, judges had limited discretion. <coughs> judges were stripped of a lot of the discretion that they had historically had. And four, well, we had what was mandatory detention, where individuals who had committed those old crimes or people who had recently arrived, many of them seeking asylum, were now facing mandatory detention. So those four areas of the, mm -hmm. that changed in terms of the law had a dramatic impact in our community. At the same time, we saw very recently an increase in what we would call the interior enforcement. And we had what was called the Secure Communities Program. And I'm sure many of you have heard about that, um, in which the government collaborated, excuse me, the federal government, immigration authorities, collaborated with local law enforcement to identify undocumented, so-called undocumented individuals, and place them into immigration proceedings. But of course, those individuals were detained. That program was a disaster. And um, two years ago, the government said, whoops, we're ending the Secure Communities Program. We're starting a new program. And that was after a number of lawsuits. They were picking up US citizens and detaining them. We have a case right now in New York where a US citizen was detained for three years under immigration authorities, allegedly because he was undocumented. Um, and the, the problem, pro, program was a disaster, and we have argued right now in Northern District of Illinois that it's unconstitutional. Um, the individuals were denied due process. And you have to remember when I talk, immigrants in immigration proceedings, even children, do not have access to court-appointed counsel. So these individuals, they're detained, 
Some of them don't speak English well. They're facing a very complicated area of law. Even Judge Posner has recognized this as one of the most complicated areas of law, more so than tax. And they don't have appointed counsel. So with these changes, dramatic changes in the law, we have seen an increase in this enforcement mm -hmm. apparatus. And I, I think your question is, what are the pros and cons? Mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard for me to think of a pro. <laughs> I would say none. <laughs> um, and I think I've illustrated the cons. And, and the major con, too, is that you know people are really being denied due process when you have this enforcement regime. And I might add one more thing. I know I'm over my time, but I ended early in the first question is we also created a fifth area I should have added was we had these fast track deportations. So individuals with certain backgrounds, whether they're within 100 miles of the border when they came in, individuals who had prior removal deportation orders, individuals who had one of those crimes they face immediate deportations without ever seeing a judge. And that was the other result of the 1996 law, which you can only imagine the errors made by an immigration official who's oftentimes not a lawyer and not trained. Sorry, are those crimes that they were committed for? Pardon me? Were those crimes that they, they were committed Convicted, for? yes, yes. But it's an immigration officer who's making the determination that that constitutes a deportable or removable offense. And we have seen cases where that was not the case. And we have a case of a mother from Mexico who was deported, and she was not deportable. And she had to leave her three or four children and her husband. And she's come back in. Now she's triggered a reinstatement removal. The next thing you know, they have her um, locked up and charged criminally for illegal reentry. So, Chilbada, how have immigrants responded to this situation? What are their legal options, and what have been uh, their social and political responses? Okay, this is like Susan, they had four questions, and this is three minutes, so I'll do my best <laughs> to tell you like, what has happened uh, and what, how they have responded. And before that, I, I think it's very important to really see the impact of 1965 immigration law that Susan was trying to get to. And very quickly, before telling you what has happened and what have been the options, I want to navigate you to the current times in terms of what does it mean, where are we in, in, in terms of how many immigrants post-1965 we have. So by 2015, the foreign-born population reached 14% of the total population, now with 45 million. And the vast majority of those, which is full 53%, come from Latin America, mostly from Mexico, El Salvador, Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala. As a consequence of new foreign-born arrivals and their US-born children, the Latino share of the US population rose from 4% in 1965 to 18% in 2005. And now we, you ha we, we have all this amidst this new system in which the criminalization of immigration is what we have as the new situation. So what, how have immigrants responded to this? Well, they have organized civically. They have participated and done lots of solidarity, the level of organization and the formalization of, their, of the migrant-led organizing has really increased. We have seen increases in the rates of naturalization. So Mexicans, for example, used to be uh, very difficult to naturalize. And uh, there were only second to Canadians in their uh, rates of naturalization. But after 1996, that actually made the Mexican government very vulnerable to potential like massive deportations, Mexico rearranged its constitution to allow dual nationality. Mm -hmm. And as a result, and as many other like anti-immigrant measurements in the US, like Mexicans went very high in the rates of naturalization. And now we are seeing more and more people taking positive steps towards naturalizing. Voter participation laws have also uh, made made uh, pos the possibilities of now more and more Latinos are registering to vote. And hopefully in this election, they are going to turn out in great numbers. 
that's the hope. Uh, there has been good get out the vote campaigns. And also the, the rallies that they organized in the spring of 2006 have created a long lasting impact in terms of organizing. Three to five million marched peacefully in the streets in, in the entire spring of 2006, recognizing their value to this society. And one of the rallying cries was, we are workers, we are not criminals. But the legal options are very few, like the only remnants of the 1996 law that now disappeared right after the, the, the Twin Towers fell is the Section 245I. And I remember I used to work for Marimec and the Mexico U.S. Advocates Network in the last push when the Section 245I was the last hope, the last resort for adjustment of its status. We are talking about the year 2001, after 245I was no longer allowed for adjusting status for those who are here without documents. There are no options other than the deferred action for childhood arrivals, the so-called DACA. But this DACA is a temporary situation. These students that are given this option are getting into a legal limbo that needs to be renewed every three years now. But this is a situation that we, are, we do not know what's going to be the future because it's an executive action. This was not obtained through reforms in the immigration laws. So it's very similar to what happened with the Salvadorans, giving them a temporary protective status. The DACA, Deferred Childhood Arrivals, and Temporary Protective Status are very similar in its outcome in the long term. They are not going to let you become a legal permanent resident or a green card holder as such. So the, li the legal options are very limited. And I think that I will stop here and let's get to the next round. <laughs> And speaking of Salvadorans, Mary Meg, in the last two years, we have witnessed a decline in Mexican migration, but an increase in Central American migration as people flee communities with high levels of violence. How has the United States responded to this new influx, and what do you think is the responsibility of the United States in this case? Well, um, I, I want to go back to something that Sochicha said that I think is really important, and we're seeing that on the border too, unfortunately, is we've blurred immigration and criminal laws together. So what we're seeing is the criminalization of immigrants, and we see that at the border, and as we see people coming into the country seeking protection primarily from Central America, I'm sure many of you have read and heard about 2014, we had an influx of unaccompanied immigrant children, primarily from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Um, and since then, we've continued to see those children, but oftentimes now with their mothers. And the U.S. response has been, well, initially it was deterrence. It's too dangerous for people to come. We have to stop them from coming. Well, I always argued, uh, so we keep people in a burning house. That's not the solution, right? Um, and now what we're seeing is a whole perspective of this is about um, border management. We have to more manage our borders as opposed to a humanitarian response. Um, these are individuals who are fleeing for their lives. Um, the the crime rate, the murder rate, the violence is one of the highest. I think El Salvador now has the highest murder rate in the world based on its population, and Honduras is second. Um, these are our neighbors in our own backyard who are facing horrendous violence. That yes, that needs to be addressed, but in the meantime, we need to be welcoming these individuals and providing them with legal protection. But what we're doing instead is, remember I talked about the, the immediate removals, the fast track removals? Well, many of them are being placed in that process. And if they don't express a fear, they will be deported back. And we've seen a number of those cases. And the US Commission on Religious Freedom has documented the number of cases. We've also seen that if they pass that credible fear, they're detained. We went from 100 beds in, let's see, 2000, summer of 2014, to 3,000 beds for families. So in 2014, we had 100 beds to detain families. Today, there are 3,000 beds detaining families, mothers and children. And guess who runs those facilities, those jails? Private prisons. 
So it's on the backs of these traumatized asylum seekers that the private prisons are making money. Um, the other challenge that they're facing is if they do get released, and um, there was a, uh, a, not a Supreme Court, but a Ninth Circuit case um, in which the judge said, look, you cannot indefinitely detain these children, going back to uh, a settlement agreement from 20 years ago. So now they're releasing them and people are getting out faster from these jails, but they're putting them on ankle bracelets. So we have clients here who've come from the border who are now here in the Chicago area who are walking around with an ankle bracelet that often and talks to them while they're on the bus is very humiliating and embarrassing and has caused physical harm. We had one client who was at the hospital having it removed because she had so much bleeding around her ankle. Um, you know, these are, again, mothers who are trying to protect their children and their own lives. Um, the other third issue that we're finding is that the immigration court, which is where all these individuals have to um, prove their case or they'll face deportation, um, have horrendous backlogs. We as a, government, a country have placed so much money in that enforcement mechanisms that we have not placed corresponding funds to support an adjudication system. So people are waiting years for their case to be adjudicated, oftentimes without work authorization, without ability to uh, live a safe and normal life. So um, I think there's a lot of things that we can do to have a more humanitarian response um, from improving our systems to even looking at temporary protected status for those individuals fleeing the, the terrible violence that exists in those three countries today. Thank you, Mary Meg. We have a couple more questions before we open it up for Q&A. So my next question is for Sochi, thinking about sort of the larger structural issues. One of the important issues to understand is the dissonance between our immigration policies and our economic practices. Since rural and urban labor is recruited and sometimes heavily recruited by corporations and subcontractors in the United States. Can you discuss, Sochi, how this recruitment works what are some of the problems with it, and what are future trends? Yes, thank you, Amalia. Um, this is uh, very important to discuss because there is a tremendous dissonance because what the United States says and what the United States do. Because I don't know how familiar you are with this recruitment of foreign labor for low skill or non-skilled jobs. And what happens is that this is very big corporations that were both at the level of the blue collar and also the white collar positions that are sent to rural places in Central America and Mexico. And they distribute pamphlets and leaflets even for the Alaska like uh, ship lines that are like picking fish and for farm work, et cetera. And they are actively recruiting workers for a fee. And these workers come under the so-called H2A two, two, uh, um, and H2B uh, type of contracts. There are contracts that will never lead to permanent residency, and they are short, and they sometimes do not enjoy, or oftentimes do not enjoy the same legal protections that are afforded to United States worker under the federal labor laws. Because due to the extreme lobby that the agribusiness operates in the United States, they have been exempt from many of the protections that are given to, to workers that are not in farm sector jobs. So what this happened is that lots of abuses uh, happens, including indentured labor, cases of slavery, wage theft, they pay less than minimum wage, and remember that these are workers that came to the United States legally. We are not talking about illegal labor here. Those came legally. And the type of abuses are large. But what has happened? So the situation is very concerning now because so that to give you an idea of what is happening due to the changes that, ha that now Mexico has with their increases in the middle class, Mexico is no longer able to provide mm -hmm. the amount of farm work labor that used to provide in the US. And over the last century, roughly 3 million migrants and seasonal farm workers on average were in the United States at any one time. Mm -hmm. But as of 2012, that number had dropped to 1 million, including part-time and full-time workers, according to the Farm Labor Survey conducted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
Just in the Midwest, there are 57,000 legal immigrants with work visas in agriculture, livestock, raising and food processing. However, the sector needs another 80,000 workers mm. immediately. How this is going to pan out? Now, United States is competing actively with Mexican mm -hmm. farmers for the same pool of labor. And now that the educational levels of the median education of years of schooling of Mexican workers have gone up, the possibilities of Mexico being the primary source of farm work labor for the United States are diminishing. This is why we have seen an increase, a tremendous increase in the recruitment of H2A and H2B with all the problems that the, those type of contracts bring mm -hmm. for violation of labor laws, that are violation of US labor laws. So this is pretty much how it works. So we see on the one hand that the United States says, oh, go back to the line. By the way, there is no line. Mm -hmm. After 1965, the elimination of the quota system that Susan unfortunately could not finish the entire process of how it works, like Mexico gets the same number of legal visas per year as Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. And look at the size of the two countries. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Sochil. Susan, you have the last word. Um, <laughs> well, no, the audience will have the last word. <laughs> I, so uh, feel free to answer this question and any other comments on whatever we've talked about um, previously. The debate on immigration is often informed by arguments about the costs and benefits of migration to the United States. Can you briefly discuss what you think are the main costs and what are the main benefits? Sure, I wanna start with benefits and this morning I decided to take a look at the Cubs roster. Um, three, <laughs> three of the Cubs, 11 pitchers are immigrants. And we all know the contributions of immigrant players to the quality of baseball in the United States. It's been tremendous, and let's hope that those immigrant pitch pitchers help the Cubs uh, get over tonight. Um, some of the other benefits I think are obvious to many of us, because we live in a very diverse city, and which has really reaped incredible benefits from successive waves of immigrants here. So we can count among the benefits um, a tremendous cultural diversity, which has improved our diets, which has improved <laughs> our understanding of the world, which has improved our cultural offerings of all sorts in across the arts. Um, I noticed my, I was looking at my phone to get this statistic about the Cubs and I saw a headline that says, Chicago restaurant winners of Michelin stars begin to leak. Well, you know who's working in those kitchens that are producing Michelin star quality food, that that's a Im largely immigrant labor force. Um, we also benefit from the work of immigrants in um, at all, in all levels of our labor force. And I don't like to use the terms high-skilled and low-skilled. It seems to me it's more highly compensated and less well compensated because no one can say that um, the Nigerian women, woman who was helping us care for my mother when she was sinking into dementia was low skilled. She might have been low paid by the facility she was working in, but that was a very high skill. So across the labor force, immigrants have added their energy to what we have produced. They've also added their talent, and there's also a statistic I didn't get of the number of US-based Nobel Prize winners who, the, who actually are immigrants. And this continues to be true. It's not just a phenomenon of the you know, anti-fascist refugees leaving Europe in the post-World War II period. Um, immigrants benefit us and our city as consumers. Mm -hmm. Think of the numbers of stores, particularly in, in the city of Chicago, where the capacity of their owners to make a living depends on the spending of immigrants as consumers. I mean, there are many targets and supermarkets and vegetable stands that you can walk into where both on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, the owners um, and the workers and their customers are all immigrants contributing to our tax base, et cetera. Another place where we have really benefited in an unfair way are the contributions specific that I want to name specifically are the contributions to our social security retirement mm -hmm. funds by immigrant workers and many of them by undocumented workers who will never be able to retrieve those funds. I know that my retirement will be funded 
by immigrant workers. Um, so there are very many concrete, way, concrete and less concrete ways in which immigration constitutes a benefit. Um, what are the costs? That's a harder thing to get into. It's like being asked in an employment interview, what are your weaknesses? You know, it's like, I don't want to lead with my chin. But I think there's some things that we do want to talk about. One is, it's not really healthy for a democracy if a significant percentage of the population isn't able to participate in the making of public policy. In other words, you can see it at the local level. For example, in some of the collar counties, the, the county <coughs> seats of those counties, um, some of our ring suburbs, Cicero, Berwyn, where you have a voting population that is made up of um, citizens who up until very recently have been predominantly older and white making decisions for example about funding which will be put into the school systems of those communities where the beneficiaries of the school systems are coming from immigrant families and many of those parents don't have the franchise as voters. It means that public policy being made in those communities isn't really for the good of the whole community because there's a certain percentage of people who are barred from participating in the, the electoral process although many people have made their opinions felt in those communities through direct action and contributed politically in other ways. Similarly, it's not the fault of immigrants, but demagogic politicians who are really anti-democratic have used a fear factor, racism that they are evoking in communities that are seeing themselves go through demographic change not to the benefit of those communities. It's not the fault of, those, of the immigrants themselves, but it is a project, a product of demographic change and large-scale immigration. And then it's not true, the frequently heard um, accusation, not in this city, but across in other places in the country, that immigrants are soaking up public benefits. Immigrants are not soaking up public benefits because most immigrants, even many legal immigrants, are not eligible for cash benefits or medical assistance, etc. There is one way, and I had a talk on the phone this morning with Commissioner Jesus Garcia about this, in which immigrants and others are costing the society something. Many local communities with high indices of poverty or low income people who either because of their migration status or their income or for other reasons do not have health insurance are paying a lot of money to provide health care for people in those in that status. Cook County spends millions of dollars every year on uncompensated care. But it is a social good that all of the Cook County commissioners, even the Republicans, even the conservatives, certainly agree on. We don't want people with infectious diseases and serious injuries wandering around our communities untreated. It would not only be a humanitarian and moral disgrace, but also a public health danger. So communities with high immigrant populations and also high numbers of other people who are unable to afford Obamacare or who are ineligible for um, direct medical benefits are costing some money, but it's a public health decision made by us as decent human beings to spend some of our taxpayer money on those costs. So I think it's a complicated and nuanced discussion of costs and benefits. I see the benefits as far outweighing the costs, but I think it also can provide an impetus for whatever happens on Tuesday for us to strive in the next presidential administration for at least comprehensive immigration reform and a better integrated health care system. Wow, what a panel. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I, I just have time for questions? Yes. Can I just add one more point okay. to Susan? I think we've spoken about it, but I think it's really important to remember that many undocumented immigrants are living in mixed status oh, families. Okay. In other words... Mary Mac, that was my point four I didn't get to because oh, okay. my time was cut off. <laughs> the other cost is that we have many U.S. citizen children living without their parents because of the parents having been deported and many families that have been split. The Children's Rights Convention establishes an international standard that children's, children have the right to live in an intact family where possible and where we have policies that are splitting those families and children whose um, upbringing has to become a public charge or who are really suffering through family separation, that's a cost of not immigrants themselves, but of immigration policy. Yeah. Did you want to add something? Maybe? No, I, I just think, you know, you talk about 11 million undocumented, but there's mm -hmm. six 
18.6 million in mixed status families. So you got to just keep those numbers in perspective in terms of how you um, ensure that we keep our social fabric together and that those kids, if they lose their parents, don't end up in foster care. And statistics and studies have shown we have 5 million kids right now in foster care because parents have been deported. Okay. Thank you. So we have time for questions? Uh, okay, why don't we go with Jennifer and then Nena and then Tanya. God, I know a lot of people here. <laughs> Well, the Bracero case, as Nina Torres knows, and I know because her husband, Matt Pierce, and my ex-husband, Jonathan Rothstein, were involved in massive litigation over many years, trying to recoup at least money that was deducted from the Bracero's pay. First of all, they get low pay in the beginning. Then there was a like 30% deduction of pay to induce them to go back to Mexico. And they were told when they went back to Mexico, they'd get that 30%. Well, the 30% disappeared in the Banco de Mexico, et cetera. Um, so then there was a movement in Mexico and some movement here. So the Bracero question of both being underpaid and suffering through terrible conditions is something that is still an open sore in the decision. I think it would be an interesting area to explore. And I'm not sure. Um, I think it would be an interesting area to start laying out what the claims might be. Um, Japanese immigrants and Japanese U.S. citizens who were rounded up and put into detention camps received an apology. I don't know that they have ever received reparations. You know, with my family, it's a mixed story. You know, my grandparents were here, had difficult working conditions, but were able to achieve the American dream of their children going to college, et cetera, but suffered the loss of their siblings. So there are, I think, many, there are multiple immigrant stories that both represent opportunities and misfortune. Um, due to the status under which they immigrated or their conditions of exclusion and marginalization for reasons of race or other reasons during their time here and then what has happened to their descendants. So, you know, we had the reparations ordinance here in Chicago for victims of uh, police torture in the spring of 2015 and I think it's open to discussion, but I don't have answers. It's a big topic that will require the thinking of a lot of people to try to figure out how to frame. Let's take the next two, Nena and Tania, and maybe one more, Cindy, and then have the panel respond to all three of you. Yes, Nena. Okay, thank you, Nina. Tanya? Kind of just piggybacking on, I think everybody's been questioning about mm -hmm. exactly next Tuesday, and with regards versus, will we set the agenda for amnesty versus comprehensive sort of immigration reform and the pathway of citizenship? Um, I think that's the agenda we, we should set, but at the same time, the student access bill is going up to vote in a couple weeks, and how that plays into the public institution and UIC leading the charge. Um, with the access bill, um, what do you foreshadow uh, the passing of the bill, its impact, uh, and, and if not, what does that leave uh, institutions, public institutions, to do uh, in creating options and pathways for undocumented students? 
And just to clarify for the audience, uh, the student access bill is a state bill that would allow uh, public four-year public universities to uh, grant aid um, and scholarships uh, to undocumented students. Um, Cindy, your question? No? Okay. So, panel? Okay, I'll take the Trump one. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you what has been happening, and I've been very excited because in June, uh, the UNAM Chicago campus, and the UNAM is the, the largest national public university in Mexico and is the largest in Latin America, organized a panel with that question, mm -hmm. and I, like what will happen with the Trump presidency, and it was like a full house. I was so impressed in River North. It was packed, not just in the presence of the like, people going to the panel, I was invited as a panelist, but also the, the, those who were hooked on, um, on Facebook. So Facebook Live had like 2,000 mm. regi regist uh, people registering to the panel live. And so they were like trying to, f and it was a mixed panel of Mexican academics with US academics to try to think together, like from the point of view of academia, how can we move forward with creating better bridges between Mexico and the United States? There has been lots of interest for Mexico's uh, media. There is a documentary uh, now being filmed in the United States. I was asked by one of the TV channels to offer an interview for precisely the same question. It's gonna be aired soon in Mexico. So what I will say for the students, this is now the time to start to great, to increase commonalities between what has happened to youth in Mexico as a result of neoliberalism and globalization and what has happened to youth in the United States, especially in Chicago with the great cities report that we have received lately, understanding like what have been the options for those youth, African American Latinos who have dropped out of school. I don't know how much you've been following the, the, the life of that great report that great cities produce, but it has been cited by like the entire nation of how grave the situation is for the youth. So it's very important that colleges like us start to create action plans in how we're gonna incorporate all those people who have not had the opportunity to finish high school uh, especially minorities that have been hardly hit. So I see like a great, yeah, it's gonna be terrible, but I see it as a, as a, as a coalescing force that can create immediate systems of organizing. I want to make two comments more as a lawyer than anything else. First of all, one of the things we know about Donald Trump is he really doesn't understand the system of checks and balances, nor does he respect the concept of the rule of law. But we fortunately have fairly strong institutions in this country. And so I would see that in the wake of just taking an example of the institution of massive roundups or deportations, that we have two avenues um, of countering those kinds of moves. One is the sort of inside the system, federal courts should protect the constitutional rights to due process of everyone present in the United States. That's one set. And the other is civil resistance because um, Americans have had a proud tradition of resisting the imposition of unjust laws. I mean, we can only look back um, to the sanctuary movement of the 1980s when four to 600 individual congregations in the United States took on the protection and um, cover for refugee families whose status and right to remain was not being recognized by the federal government. So uh, there's a lot that could happen. Um, I also want to comment on the speed with which um, these kinds, the taking place of these kinds of forums happens. It's not really a response to the question, but Cynthia mm -hmm. Brito Milan is taking pictures, and Nina Torres' daughter is already commenting them on, <laughs> on them on Facebook. <laughs> so, so what's happening on it, this it, panel? It is already, we're already out in social media. Despite the fact that we are not on Facebook. Mary yeah, Mary. yeah I, I just want to follow up with what. Um, Susan said, I think we're going to have to be ready to run into federal court right away to get injunctions to stop the administration from moving forward with massive roundups, massive detentions, and deportations. But I'll be honest, I fear that this thing's going to move so quickly that there's going to be casualties in all this. And, and I think it's really important that civil society organize and be out in the streets. And I think it's the religious groups, the student groups, the dreamers, um, that we really build uh, the business community, um, the law enforcement community. I mean, there were real efforts in the past 
four or five years to engage a broad group of stakeholders on the need for immigration reform. And we haven't seen that, and I'm not sure we're going to see it, no matter who wins in the next administration um, right away, because uh, there's a, a lot of pain, there's a lot of wounds that have been opened up in this presidential election. But I think it's really important that we be ready to be mobilized and to be in the courthouse as soon as we can to get injunctions on some of the really what I fear would be terrible, terrible actions. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you. That was a wonderful example of what's going on and why. And I hope that you will join us and bring your friends next Wednesday at noon for an open forum right after the election. So we'll all be tired. Um, but come and we can continue this discussion, which will be facilitated by the Dialogue Project at, um, uh, at UIC. And so uh, come and bring your friends. And thanks for being here. And again, thank you to the panel. Thank, thank you. you.